The, the pain that's in the world today is horrific and it's immeasurable. And every single one of us have experienced it. But the day is coming when Jesus returns that he is going to redeem us from the pain of this world. Today I'm teaching again from my new book, Look Up, Awaiting the Rapture and Our Final Redemption. This is it right here. And we're talking about, you know, just the excitement we should feel when we see the things looking happening in the world today because Jesus is about to come. And I'm talking in detail about another dimension of why we should be looking up and expecting the rapture and our final redemption. Before we get to the teaching, I want to remind you again about our upcoming Tipping Point Conference on September the 16th at Fellowship Church right here in the DFW Metroplex. I'm going to be sharing along with Pastor Ed Young, who's the senior pastor of Fellowship Church, Dr. Tony Evans, Jonathan Kahn, Billy Crone, and Dr. Mark Hitchcock. It's going to be a fantastic day. If you're an endtimes.com paid subscriber, be sure to use the exclusive discount code below for 50% off your ticket. Today I want to talk about redeemed pleasure. What, what is it that Jesus has redeemed for us? Well, he's going to redeem our bodies. He's going to redeem pleasure. Again, redeem means to buy back. Eden, God created Adam and Eve, and Eden, Eden means pleasure and delight. Isn't that interesting that God, God created us in a place that, that meant pleasure and delight? And you say, well, why did he do that? Because that's all he wants for us. God never intended for us to ever experience pain. And that, that's, that's hard for some people to understand because, you know, pain is, we deal with pain every day in the world. You say, well, where did pain come from? Let me read you the account of where pain entered the human race. This is in Genesis 3 when Adam and Eve rebelled against God. Uh, Genesis 3, beginning in verse 16. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow in your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. And by the way, that means you're going to want to dominate your husband, but he's going to dominate you. Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten it from the tree which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the herb of the field in the sweat of your face, you shall eat the bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. It, it would be absolutely impossible to measure the pain that the human race has experienced since that day that God cursed Adam and Eve. And he cursed them because of their rebellion. And they thought that they could eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil without consequences. And the consequences have been horrific. The wages of sin is death, not will be, not were, is death. Satan is the a wonderful advertiser of sin, but he doesn't tell you about the death that follows. And he didn't tell Adam and Eve, and they, they didn't take God's warning. The emotional pain, imagine the emotional pain, rejection, loss, failure, verbal abuse, emotional abuse, divorce, all the kinds of emotional pain people experience every day, physical pain. Abuse, illness, accidents, violence, death, disease, all those kinds of things. Mental pain, confusion, deception, abuse, lies, ignorance, poverty, spiritual attacks, relational family pain, dysfunction, rebellion, abuse, breakup, betrayal, uh, rejection, unmet needs, dominance. All these things have been happening since the day that Adam and Eve fell and God cursed the human race. The, the pain that's in the world today is horrific and it's immeasurable, and every single one of us have experienced it. But the day is coming when Jesus returns that he is going to redeem us from the pain of this world, which means in the twinkling of an eye, and I want you to listen to what I'm saying. Some of you are going through a lot of pain right now. You're going through financial stress. You're, you're dealing with the trouble in your marriage with your kids. You have a prodigal child. You have a, a, a boss maybe that's harassing you. You have somebody that's talking bad about you, criticizing you, you know, whatever it might be, a physical pain, emotional pain, whatever it is. Can I just tell you that in a twinkling of an eye, you'll never, you'll never feel pain again for all of eternity. Now that's just hard. It's hard to imagine that you will never feel pain again. Let me. This is Revelation 21 talking about what happens when we're with, with God. I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away 
and there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. That, that is incredibly good news for all of us because we're about to be redeemed. But actually, there's better news than that. Not only will we never experience pain again, we're going to experience an eternity of exquisite pleasures that are beyond our comprehension. Let me give you an example of this scripture. This is Psalm 16, 11. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Not, not only is there no pain, we're going to have an eternity of pleasures like we've never experienced before. 1 Corinthians 2, as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. I mean, we, it's, and what it's saying there is it's incomprehensible. In this life, we just can't even comprehend what it's going to be like to be in that place. This is 2 Corinthians 12. This is Paul. It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows. Such a one was caught up into the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows. How he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Now, Paul's talking about himself. And he said, 14 years ago, I don't know if I was in the body or out of the body. All I know is I was caught up to the third heaven. And he calls it paradise. Remember, Eden was a paradise, pleasure and delight. He says that that's what heaven's going to be. Jesus, in Luke 23, was hanging on the cross, and there was a thief next to him. And said, he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And so Eden was a paradise, and when Jesus returns, we go back into the paradise we were created for. And paradise always includes five things. And I want you to think about where you are right now versus where you're going to be when Jesus returns, because we're going into a paradise. Beauty, a paradise has to be beautiful. It has to be comfortable. There's no such thing as a painful paradise. Pleasure, paradise is about pleasure, a sensual type pleasure, plenty, a paradise, you have plenty of everything you're looking for and safety. There's no paradise in, in war zones. And so beauty, comfort, pleasure, plenty, and safety. The devil will be in hell. There's going to be nothing in all of eternity to harm us. And we're going to be in a perfect paradise. Compared to the paradise Jesus is taking us to, we have never experienced pleasure before. The, the world is a torture chamber. You know, we're so accustomed to this world that we just forget how bad it is. It's just terrible. And see, even the pleasures we experience in the world today, all of them have a negative impact in some way. In other words, you eat too much, you gain weight. I can't wait to get to heaven and eat a lot for a long time and not gain weight. I mean, that's just going to be incredible. Here on earth, if you rest too much, you're lazy and you fail. If you cross sexual parameters, you destroy your marriage and family. If you stay in the sun too long, you get a sunburn. If you spend too much, you go broke. But not in heaven. There is no such thing as a sin or a negative response to the indulgence of a pleasure in heaven. There's no more pain. There's no more sin. There's no more sin nature. And so literally everything in heaven is legal and pleasurable, and there's never a negative consequence to it. It's just, again, it's beyond our ability to comprehend. So a lot of people, I was trying to lead a guy to the Lord one time that I worked with before I came into the ministry. And I, uh, I was telling him about the Lord and all that kind of stuff. And, and I said to him, do you know where you would go if you died today? And he said, well, I don't want to go to heaven. And I said, you don't want to go to heaven. And he said, I don't want to sit on a cloud playing a harp for all of eternity. He said, I think that's the most boring thing in the world. That comes from Tom and Jerry's cartoons. That comes from a cartoon. His concept of heaven came from a cartoon. And when he said that to me, it got me thinking. And that is, well, I wonder what heaven is like. Okay. Well, it's phenomenal. Okay. Now I'm going to give you my version of heaven. Okay. I'm not saying that this is biblically correct, but I'm just, I'm just kind of saying this to kind of mess with you, kind of, kind of slap you in the brain. If you, if you have a concept of heaven that is boring, let me, let me just 
imagine with me for just a minute. Again, I'm just talking about this is just coming out of my mind. I'm not saying it's biblically correct, but this is just when I think of heaven, this is the thing I think about. So you go into God's presence in, in heaven. Okay, we're in heaven now. And this is my version of heaven. You go into God's presence and worship him with a perfect voice and heaven's music that is a thousand times better than any music you've ever heard before. And in your, you're in the very presence of God. You're not in a church. You're not in a sanctuary. You're in the very presence of God where there's fullness of joy. Your heart is exploding with joy and happiness. You stay there for a million years, a million years, and you never get tired, distracted, or bored. After a million years in God's presence, you decide to go with some friends and family to eat at the banquet table in paradise, and you're waited on by angels. You eat the most unbelievably delicious food for 15,000 earth years while you're having incredible conversations and fun with everyone, and you never gain weight, feel full, get sick, or need to go to the restroom or need to stop. Then you decide to go back to your mansion and have a family reunion. You tell one of the angels to gather your family and have them come to your mansion. One second later, you're in your mansion, which is on 500 acres of paradise, and your relatives begin arriving. The angels have everything perfectly prepared, and they serve you and your family for 3,600 earth years. You eat, play games, have fun, talk about memories. No one gets their feelings hurt or says they've done anything hurtful. Everyone is mature, sensitive to each other, and godly, and very loving and affectionate to one another. There are no ants, insects, you never get a sunburn, no one gets injured, you never need money, and everything you want is immediately served by the angels. At the end of the family reunion, someone suggests that you go on an adventure. So you, you and a group of your friends and relatives take a 14,000 year journey to explore the earth. There are no wild animals. You can get anywhere you want to go immediately. The world is a paradise and there's thrill after thrill that is beyond description. You can climb to the highest mountain without getting fatigued. You can swim in and under the water for 100 years and never tire, and there are no sharks or dangerous animals. There are no deserts or bad places on the earth. There's no place where any bad thing has ever happened. It's a new earth. The old earth of sin and corruption is gone. At the end of your adventure on the earth, everyone is thrilled and excited. Someone says they were exploring the universe with a group of friends recently, and they found a galaxy 300 million light years away that was really cool. So we all agree to go, and one second later, you're there. For the next 30,000 years, you explore that galaxy and its stars together as you share great experiences and see things that are beyond description. Everything you see is different from anything you've ever seen before. It's extremely fun and interesting. After this, you decide to go back home and visit the Hall of Pavilions, where you meet all the heroes of the Bible. All the original 12 disciples, not Judas, but the new one, Matthias, have their own pavilions, as well as the Apostle Paul, Mary, the mother of Jesus, King David, Daniel, Esther, and all the other Bible characters. In each pavilion, you personally meet each character and spend time talking with them and getting to know them. Also, in each of their pavilions, there's a 3D movie of what actually took place in their areas of the Bible. In Noah's pavilion, you get to watch when he built the ark, as well as the flood. In Elijah's pavilion, you watch him as he defeated the prophets of Baal. You get to watch King David in his pavilion defeating Goliath. In Mary's pavilion, you get to watch the birth of Jesus in his childhood. You also get to watch his miracles and ministry. You stay in the hall of pavilions for 40,000 years. After this, you have a strong desire to be in God's presence and worship him. So one second later, you're all in God's presence. As you're worshiping God, he looks at you and smiles. Just then you realize that an angel has you by the hand leading you toward God's throne. Suddenly you find yourself face to face with God and for 100 years he personally loves you and gives you affection as he speaks words of affirmation to you. When you're finished, you return to your place and worship him for seven million more years with a perfect voice and you never get tired or distracted. And then some friends ask you to go and eat at heaven's banquet table and so on and so on and so on. See, all I'm saying is I like my heaven. I, I like my version of heaven. That may not be exactly correct, but when I think of heaven, I get so excited. I just think it's going to be the most interesting place, the most phenomenal place. It's going to be so far beyond anything that I just said. But again, 1 Corinthians 2, I has not seen nor ear heard nor has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But there are people who have died and actually gone to heaven. One of the most credible reports of someone dying and coming back was uh, a man named Don Piper. Uh, he wrote a book called 90 Minutes of Heaven. It was a true story of life and death. This is, this is a documented account of a man who died for 90 minutes and came back to life. And he went to heaven and he wrote about this experience in his book, 90 Minutes in Heaven. This is an excerpt from his book. And here's what he says. 
Everything I experienced was like a first-class buffet for the senses. I had never felt such powerful embraces or feasted my eyes on such beauty. Heaven's light and texture defy earthly eyes or explanation. Warm, radiant light engulfed me. As I looked around, I could hardly grasp the vivid, dazzling colors. Every hue and tone surpassed anything I'd ever seen. With all the heightened awareness of my senses, I felt as if I'd never seen, heard, or felt anything so real before. I don't recall that I tasted anything, yet I knew that if I had, that too would have been more glorious than anything I had eaten or drunk on the earth. The best way I can explain it is to say that I felt as if I were in another dimension. Never, even in my happiest moments, that I ever felt so fully alive. I stood speechless in front of the crowd of loved ones, still trying to take in everything. Over and over, I heard how overjoyed they were to see me and how excited they were to have me among them. I'm not sure if they actually said the words or not, but I knew that they had been waiting and expecting me, yet I also knew that in heaven there is no sense of time passing. Now, we're just a twinkling of an eye from experiencing that right there. Let me, let me just answer a question very quickly because as I talk about this, one of the things that I do in my book and try to do in these teachings is to answer some real questions that people have. And one of the questions that people have is, how can a loving God send people to hell? When you hear how phenomenal God is, then why would a loving God send people to hell? And let me a answer this question in three parts. And this will help you uh, to answer the question that maybe people would ask you. The number one part of this answer is the ultimate gift God has given us is free will. But with that gift, there's consequences. And God gave Adam and Eve a free will and told them if they ate the forbidden fruit, they would die. But they did it anyway. And the horrible consequences that we see right now on the earth, it is the, the result of the uh, willed rebellion of human, human beings against God. You cannot have a free will without consequences. If you could, there'd be no meaning to life and, and no justice. Imagine just a minute, there's no difference between a loving mother and a child abuser. See, if, if there is no hell, if there, is, if there is no consequence for our choices, then a loving mother and a child abuser are the same. A murderer and a doctor are the same. A thief and a diligent worker are the same. A drunk and an Olympic athlete, no difference. An atheist and a missionary, a cynic and a believer. Adolf Hitler and Abraham are the same, sitting at heaven's table together, no difference, no consequences. No reward for Abraham, no consequence for Adolf Hitler. The Apostle Peter and Judas are the same. Osama bin Laden and SEAL Team, Seal Team 6 are the same. Abraham Lincoln and John Wilkes Booth are the same. And Martin Luther King and the Ku Klux Klan are the same. If you had a world free, well, free will without consequence, you would have a world of mass confusion, corruption, and violence a thousand times worse than it is today. We have a free will, and with it, there are consequences. The suffering we see in the world today is partly because of the sin of Adam and Eve and the consequences of their fall, and partly because of all of our sins. And the only way to take it away is to take away our free will. The second part of my answer here is the only way to heaven is to use our free will to choose Jesus Christ as our Savior. Revelation 3.20, Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and dine with him and he with me. And so he's talking about the door of our hearts is he's knocking on the door of our hearts, and if we open the door, he's going to come in. Well, he's not going to kick the door down. He's not going to force himself on us. That's not the way he is. He makes himself real to everyone. Uh, Romans chapter 1 says, even through creation, he's revealed himself to every person. But I have to choose God myself. And someone might say, well, Jimmy, I don't understand. If God is a loving God, why doesn't everybody go to heaven? Well, let me explain something to you. So in Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, there's a paradise. And Ezekiel 28 calls it the Garden of God, Eden, the Garden of God. The first Eden was in eternity's past, and God created an order of angelic beings there. And we're told that Lucifer, which means light bearer, that he exalted himself above God, rebelled against God, and he and a third of the angels in heaven rebelled against God without a sin nature in the presence of God. They there had never been a bad day. They never had a bad daddy, nothing like that. They just, in the presence of God, decided to rebel. Okay, that was the first Eden. The second Eden was the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. And God created two perfect people in a perfect paradise, and he lived with them. And everything he created was good except for one tree. Okay, There was one tree there because the, he had to give them an opportunity to use their free will against him or their free will would have been a sham. Okay, There had to be an opportunity 
for them to use their free will. So he said, "There's there it is right there. There's that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Everything on the earth is under your authority, but that one tree, is, you can't eat of that tree. What do they do? They walked over and ate of that tree. Okay. Perfect people in the presence of God without a sin nature, never a bad day, never a bad daddy. They had nothing to, they had no bone to pick, but they rebelled against God. In other words, the first time in eternity's past, God created a perfect place with created beings, they rebelled against him for no reason. Then he created mankind in a perfect place. They rebelled against him for no reason. In the Father's house where we're going, uh, the New Jerusalem, everyone there will choose it. See, God doesn't want this. Do you want to be in heaven and for there will be a rebellion that breaks out like there was in, in uh, on the first two Edens? No, I don't want to be there. And so for the next Eden, Whoever goes there chose it. Why? It's because God doesn't want there to be people that don't want to be there, that end up rebelling against him again. He wants a group of family. It's all about family. We are God's family. We call him Father. He's, he's not the flashing head like in the Wizards of Oz. He's a loving daddy, and he wants a family to love him. He doesn't want just beings that obey him. He wants a family to love him. And so... The reason that God wants us to choose, forces us to choose him, is because he wants this to be different than the other times when people rebelled against him. There's one more part of this answer, and that is, why would anyone refuse the grace of such a loving God? Now, see, we always put the burden on God and say, God, well, you know, why would you send people to hell? Well, God doesn't send anybody to hell. They send themselves. Let me ask you this question. Though. Why would anyone refuse the grace of uh, such a loving God. Jesus died for our sins. We're saved by grace, not by our works. It's a free gift. No one, no one can say I couldn't have had it. Everyone can have it because it's a free gift. Why would anyone refuse such a loving God? And Jesus told us in uh, John chapter three, because they didn't, they didn't want to come to the light because their deeds were evil. That's what he said. And so hell is avoidable if we accept God's grace and we understand that we have a free will, and with that, there are consequences. So we're going to go very soon to a, a life of total pleasure. No more pain for all of eternity. I just think that's phenomenal news. My book, Look Up, I talk about pleasure. I talk about new bodies. I talk about all the different things, nine different areas that Jesus redeemed. And when you understand this, it's just totally encouraging. Hey, thank you for joining me for today's program. If you want to see the full program, including the subscriber portion, go to endtimes.com, $7 a month, $77 a year. Become a subscriber. We want you to see not only the whole Tipping Point show, but all of our other articles, all of our other videos that come out all week long. Become a subscriber to endtimes.com. I'll see you next time.